Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Melissa Romero, Forensic Science Consultant and CNN Media Group. I will be moderating today's event. This webinar is Materials Informatics for Product Development, Deliver Big with Small Data. This event is sponsored by NThought. CNN works with sponsors to identify topics of interest and value to CNN's audience and consistent with CNN's mission to provide news and analysis of the chemistry enterprise in a timely, accurate, and balanced fashion. During the webinar, you can adjust the size of the slides on your screen by grabbing the lower right corner with your mouse. If you need technical assistance, please look at the help widget at the bottom of your screen or type your query into the Q&A box. If you're disconnected during the webcast, please log in again according to the instructions that you received earlier. You're encouraged to contribute to the success of this webinar by asking questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A box on your screen. The questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, and as your moderator, I will be posing as many as time permits. This webcast allows certification of participation. To receive your certificate, please click on the certificate icon below your Q&A box to download your copy after watching the webinar. Please note that CNEN does not endorse any company products or services that may be mentioned in the webinars. Each webinar will be archived at CNEN online after the live webcast. The presentation today is sponsored by NThought. NThought partners with science-driven companies to digitally transform and automate their R&D organizations for faster discovery and continuous innovation. NThought has been a longtime leader in scientific computing, computing and brings a deep understanding of material science and chemistry and the complexities of scientific data. They provide a wide range of services, including development of enterprise-level AI machine learning solutions and tools, as well as digital capability building for internal R&D teams. During the presentation today, we will be hearing from Dr. Chris Farrow and Dr. Michael Heiber. Dr. Chris Farrow holds his PhD in physics from Michigan State University and degrees in physics and mathematics from the University of Nebraska. Chris has spent 16 years working as a physicist in the materials discovery and characterization. And at NThought, Chris currently leads the material science solutions group as vice president where he oversees digital transfer transformation solutions for the specialty chemicals and semiconductor industries, as well as the development of novel technologies for materials data management and discovery. Dr. Michael Heiber holds his PhD in polymer science from the University of Akron and a BS in material science and engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Prior to joining NThought, he was a postdoctoral researcher at several institutions where he worked to digitally transform his own organic electronic materials and device development research using physics-based sim simulations, automated experimental measurements, and automated data analysis tools. At NThought, Mike leads the materials informatics teams and helps clients leverage machine learning and AI to make better, faster R&D decisions. And let's get started. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Chris Farrow. Hi there. Yep. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you all for attending the webinar. You know, I'm Chris. My co-worker Mike and I, you know, our work at NThought really involves using machine learning and AI to solve challenges in materials development um, for you know, chemicals and uh, materials industries. And we've been doing this for a number of years now with our clients. We're backed up by a world-class MI team that really stays on the leading edge of what you can do with MI uh, through this work. You know, this work has included over the years um, generating uh, new structures for OLEDs and uh, photoresists and filters and screening them for specific properties. Um, work such as discovering new catalysts for carbon utilization, optimizing formulations for a variety of materials that are used um, in the auto industry, such as plastics, elastomers, and lubricants. And more recently, we've been using you know, large language models to help summarize and extract information from technical texts, such as patents and uh, research papers, to, all towards accelerating research. And, with our time in this industry, industry, we've seen a lot of forces kind of pushing people towards AI and machine learning. You know, somewhat impactful and, and recent, we've seen a lot of companies that were you know, commodity suppliers of materials move over to specialties. Perhaps they're seeing the uh, the margins, the, the revenue that one can get by doing that, and they want to be part of it. But that's leading to increased demand. Um, I'm sorry, increased uh, um, 
pressure in those industries to go faster, to um, to produce things cheaper, essentially leading back towards commoditization. People are looking at AI, AI and machine learning as a means to relieve that pressure. We're also seeing a lot of innovation in developing green and sustainable products from plastics to consumer goods. And again, AI and machine learning are playing a role in that to accelerate that research. You, know, you may have experienced supply chain issues recently. And what we saw happening is you know, some labs were forced to essentially reformulate their products using new feedstocks to work with new suppliers. And that was painful. It would have been much less painful you know, had a way, if they had a way to you know, really understand their data and use it in a data-driven way um, for that reformulation. And another thing happening in the industry is just the emergence of digital native companies. These companies are using machine learning and AI, simulation, automation from the start and how they're developing products. And a lot of people are sitting back and, and waiting to see, you know, wondering when do we have to react to this? You know, I would say that um, not a lot of innovations are needed for those companies to be successful. It's really just a matter of time and money. So I'd say now, now is when you should react to it. Um, however, you know, what we've seen in the industry and what we heard from you is that a lot of people aren't really using these technologies yet. When we surveyed you, and, and thank you for filling out that survey when you registered, you know, the majority of you are not using these technologies yet to accelerate your work. There's a handful of people who are exploring pilot projects. Perhaps you're looking for the use cases that are going to bring you value for your product development. In a smaller number, um, they're, you're creating solutions of your own, you're using platforms. I'd say this trend generally is um, representative of what's going on in the industry. And part of it is, as I said, people are, they're waiting and seeing. Um, they're happy to be a laggard and let other people figure out the hard stuff. Um, and another reason why people are waiting, I'd say, is just the state of, of our labs and how we go about developing products. You know, the traditional lab that um, many of you may work in, it does a good job of generating you know, new materials, creating new products. You have teams of people who can reason about the structures and uh, formulations, the processing that needs to be done in order to create something new. You don't get it right on the first time. Um, you know, it's expected that you're going to get close and then you're going to iterate. And of course there's room for efficiency, but you know, this is the structure that's gotten us, you know, this far as, uh, in, in these industries. From a data-driven perspective, however, you know, there are some challenges. You know, one would think that this iterative approach would generate a lot of data, especially since this has been the paradigm for many, many years. But, well, not all that data is collected. Um, it tends to be clustered around the success cases. And, um, you know, it's not all recorded. And it's slow. I mean, people are running these processes, and it does take time to generate data, even though everybody's working hard. To be data-driven, you kind of have to look at this as a function. Your chemical structures, formulation recipes, process variables, that, that has to be data. The lab itself trans, does a transformation of that data into materials properties. Even though you're creating materials or perhaps devices for testing, it's really the properties that have to be recorded. And that function itself is, um, it's noisy. It's noisy because different people will do the same thing in different ways, you'll get different answers. The same person may do something different in the morning than they do in the afternoon when they're ready to go to work. And all that variability and, and bias, it's not actually captured. It's not supposed to be part of the process. Um, and that makes it difficult to get started. But you know, over these years, we've been helping companies make a transformation from that towards being more data-driven, having an optimized R&D process where data is captured, where you have tools that assist you in formulation or doing your product development in general. And that's what we're here to talk about. You know, what we're what we're going to tell you is that you know there are things you can do. There's pitfalls, of course, but we'll tell you what we've seen in the industry over these years, and give you some tips for you know how to avoid those and keep making progress. So perhaps you can be somebody who moves from doing pilots to really internalizing this technology to bring it in as part of your competitive advantage. So at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Mike, and he's going to go into some detail on, on how we go about doing this. Mike. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for me for the introduction. Um, so yeah, building off of, of what Chris just said here, like the idea is to leverage machine learning and AI to help your researchers make this next decision. So when you're going through this iterative loop, you want to use these technology tools to help your researchers with the work that they're currently doing. And ideally, 
All right, you can imagine this system if it was the ideal case, you would ingest you know, all of your data, all of your spreadsheets, your, your raw data files, your spectra, your images, everything you have, and you would develop a, a computing system that would tell you what to do. You would say, okay, customer A wants you know, XYZ properties, okay, system, go tell me what to make in the lab. This is the big, really hard problem. Um, you're not likely to be able to do that. Even if you were to collect and curate every piece of data you ever collected, um, this would be a very challenging thing. Um, and it's good to keep this as a vision maybe one day, um, but it, it can be very risky to go after this as like, we're gonna build this thing that does all this magic stuff um, because it's a very challenging problem. And the reason why it's so challenging is if I take a more realistic look at this, this cartoon that, we, that Chris showed previously, you know, as inputs to the lab, you don't just have you know these five little green squares which we depicted here. In reality, you have many, many knobs in the lab to tune properties. You have lots of chemical variation, you have lots of processing variation, you have formulation. So you can easily have you know tens or even hundreds of degrees of freedom on this problem. And in order to, from a machine learning perspective, in order to predict you know all those inputs and all the different variations and how those affect your material properties, you need to generally have 10 to 100 times as many observations or trials as you have degrees of freedom or parameters in your inputs. So that you're looking at needing very, very large amount of data. And these numbers also generally assume that that data is relatively uniformly spread out over the parameter space, which also isn't true. Chris mentioned, um, you know, most of the times you have highly clustered data around areas where you have current products, where things have worked in the past. You probably don't have a lot of data where things don't work so well because you've learned in your human mind that that's not a good place to go. And so you don't, you don't explore that area very often. Uh, humans are very biased in that way towards um, previous successes um, and really focus in fairly quickly on areas that are good. And so you can't actually develop machine learning models that predict everything like this. You really, you just don't have enough data. Uh, in reality, most labs are dealing with what we would call small data. This means, you know, hundreds at the most, maybe thousands of examples of, of measurements of actually curated data. And so they're wondering, you know, well, if that's the case, can I even do machine learning? Is it worth doing? You know, we've heard frequently that people say, well, I don't have enough data so maybe I, I shouldn't worry about this. I'll just kind of ignore that. And maybe later we'll come back to machine learning later. And so I'm curious to, to pull everybody, you know, as you think about the data that you have in your lab and your team, you know, in the group you manage, um, what are your small data challenges uh, to expand upon this a little further? So we're going to bring up a poll here. Um, please uh, take a look. There's uh, you know, four, five different options here. Uh, maybe choose the ones that you think best represent the challenge that, that your, your group is facing. And to be fair, these are all various things that we've heard people say that they struggle with um, in, in the clients that we talk to. Um, and so you're not, you're not alone um, in any of these issues. These are real, real issues and um, they can be tackled. All right. So let's see uh, what you all said. I'll give it maybe 10 more seconds here. Some of you guys are still filling it in. Okay. All right, let's see the results so far. So it looks like many of you are, the, the top issue here, according to many of you, is that your data is not well organized or accessible. Um, that's a very common issue that we see, right? You have some files somewhere, um, but can you find the ones you need? Can you extract the data? Can you make sense of what's in there? You can also see that the second biggest issue here is, you know, this, this thinking that we have too little data to develop library or to develop models uh, that are good enough for our needs. So I'm gonna talk about some of these issues and I'll try to refer back to these uh, as I go through some tips um, to overcome these issues and move forward. So yeah, I'm gonna present now uh, six tips for materials informatic success uh, with small data. And to do that, I'm gonna try to, to combine uh, into a single sort of story here, 
you know, many years of experience that we've had working across many industries and, and materials problems, as Chris mentioned earlier, into sort of one example um, of an electronic materials business that's trying to leverage data-driven methods, right? Time, trying to get involved in materials informatics to accelerate product development for their business. Um, now, many of you are not in this industry. You might be in other industries, but I want you to just imagine for a minute that this is your company and your lab um, and try to think of what, you know, try to draw the parallels that you see in this story to what you might be facing um, and try to use this as, as, a, as somewhat of an initial guide to help you think about what you might do next uh, in your team. So in this electronic materials business, this is a highly specialized uh, products. These are generally high margin products. And there's a lot of customization done for each product because products are sort of tweaked for each customer. And then once the properties are tweaked just right, a customer will make a big purchase for a lot of you know, that chemical, which will then be manufactured and sold. Um, these materials are deposited as thin films and then in these devices, they serve you know, many roles inside of displays, uh, semiconductor microchips or um, memory devices. And they're multifunctional materials, like they have certain processability requirements, they have electronic and optical properties, thermal stability, chemical stability, adhesion, all these things that you need to actually make them work up to spec in the end use application. And as I said, there's, there's many different products in this business, but generally they all have the same need. They wanna develop new products faster so that they can meet the needs of their customers. And so they're wondering, what do we do? Like, they have some of these same issues that, that you all are facing. We don't have a lot of data, it's, it's disorganized, I can't find what I'm looking for, so, so what do I do? And um, it's important to note that as we're looking at you know, transforming this business, we're not starting with a green field. This is an operating business, it generates profit for your company. Um, we can't just blow it up and create something brand new. So we need to find a way to transform this business, make it more productive, make it more efficient, without destroying what's made it successful for many years already. And so the first tip we have is uh, to get started with what you have. So we've heard often, you know, many, many people, they're trying to figure out how to get started. Well, what do, what do we do? So one of the first things that they'll say is, well, we don't have any kind of data infrastructure. We don't have data management, right? Our data is disorganized, it's all over the place. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna you know, build up our data infrastructure first, and then later maybe we'll get to actually doing something with the data. And the, the point, point here is you don't need enterprise level data infrastructure in place in your company uh, to get started. Uh, this can need, needlessly delay getting, getting value from MI. Um, and these infrastructural decisions that you make about these, these big purchases and big setups done by your IT are, are decisions that are being driven by their needs, not necessarily by the needs that you have in the lab and how the tools and the data uh, and the workflows interact with your business. The second tip is you do not need to get all of your historical data organized. Like the biggest issue that you guys said in that poll was that a lot of your data is disorganized. So you don't need to, to you know, ingest and curate all of that data before you get started. You could actually end up wasting a lot of time trying to wrangle very complicated disorganized data that in the end is not necessarily all that valuable to what you're trying to do now in your business, especially as you go back in history, some of that historical data, especially if it's highly clustered around an area that you're no longer active in, um, it may not be actually valuable to the current needs of your business. Um, so there's things you can do to help focus those efforts, get started with a small amount of that data um, and start making uh, headway. So as an example, there are different paths to getting value out of a data-driven solution. And this illustrates sort of the infrastructure first approach here on the left. And a lot of people think that this is how you should do things, especially people that are coming from IT backgrounds or, or talk a lot to people in IT. IT. IT organizations generally think this way about building digital infrastructure, right? You're gonna get the, the databases, the compute, the, the, all the foundational stuff, the infrastructure built first across your company, then you're gonna configure it to the different needs of your businesses or the different sub processes in your, in your labs. And then once that's done, you're gonna say, okay, well now let's start doing specific point solutions. Let's build an app to do this. Let's build a machine learning model to do that. And so you're, you're kind of building up from, the, from a foundation of, of strength. And this sounds reasonable, 
Uh, but again, the problem is um, you're making lots of really important decisions here at the bottom before you know what you're going to need at the end of the day. And so um, in an area of high uncertainty where things are changing rapidly, your business might be very dynamic, the labs are dynamic, um, it actually is much better to go the other way. And this is the way that we almost always recommend our clients to do is to start first at what you, what do you actually want to do, right? First start off with the apps. Okay, what? let's look at your process. Let's look at your business. What do you actually, what's going to make a change for the better in your business? Um, and you get that scoped out and then you say, okay, well, what do, what do I need below that to make, to enable that to happen? And then, so you, you build downward here in this depiction from, from top to bottom. And then you're making your infrastructure decisions based on very specific value driven statements about, I need this because it does this for my business. And of course, as you grow this, you build more apps, you're going to start to build out a clear vision for your infrastructure and there may be need to be some consolidation and things that happen at some point but all of those things that happen can be driven by value happening in the labs and value that supports the, the business that you're in so this is generally how we would recommend um, proceeding the second one is as we're doing this again we want to focus on smaller tractable problems and not going after the, the big really really hard problems all at once especially if you're early on in your journey. Don't take on too much risk all at once um, because you could get stuck. Um, so again, you do not need to solve the large complex multi-objective optimization problem first. This is ultimately what you wanna solve, um, but you can take it in smaller pieces. So most product development processes proceed by a series of smaller optimization loops. Uh, you can work with your domain experts to identify high impact areas that are smaller to get started. And you can even start to you know, narrow down some of your parameter space sort of artificially at first, especially when you're trying to develop a proof of concept or a pilot to demonstrate that this is gonna work. And then you can use that to justify further investment in building out a more complete solution. So in this example of an electronic materials business that we're in, uh, this is generally how many of these businesses operate. They're, they're, in this case, they're creating uh, polymer thin films, um, and they go through a, a series of, of steps here. Um, there's many more than actually six, but I'm kind of giving you a rough outline of the process. So they're uh, synthesizing custom polymers in the lab. They have a team doing this, and they take the products of that, and they do formulation. There are a bunch of different additives and things that go into that formulation, and then they bring those formulations into the clean room, where they do their application testing. So they're trying to fairly closely mimic what the actual customer will be doing in their fabrication facility. So they're spin coating uh, those fluids onto a substrate, uh, creating a thin film, and then they're doing photolithography to pattern that thin polymer film, and then they're characterizing it in a number of ways, one of which is actually just you know, visually or spatially looking at uh, the pattern that's been created. And in this very human driven, you know, traditional lab, this process can take, you know, a couple of weeks to do the whole thing just for one, one new idea of a new material. And this is a fairly slow and inefficient uh, workflow. And if you look at this, you can imagine many ways to make it better. But again, you want to focus on something smaller first. You, you really need to focus um, and find something that can, can lead to an early, early win. And so to do that, we recommend um, mapping out your process. So imagine you were, you know, looking at your process, really mapping out, okay, what are the steps? So here's a, a process diagram that I've generated for this, sort of a generic one. But you would, you would draw out from left to right here, these are the steps that we perform in the lab. Coming out from to the top here, this is the kind of data we generate, right? These, these files, this, these results. Um, you could put in a lot more information here than I am showing here about file types and file sizes. And there's lots of information you could gather, but you want to start to, to pull this out and start gathering information on what is your process. Uh, many labs don't do this. If you're a manufacturing site, you probably definitely have this done. You would know exactly your process. And the reason is because in a manufacturing setting, the process is very well defined. In R&D, it's less well defined, and it might not always be this clean. You might have, you, you might say, well, we don't always do it the same way. We do it different every time. We'll start, you could still capture some of the branch points, you know, how, or why do you decide to do it different? Um, I'd be willing to bet if you thought really carefully about this process with a team that you have working with, 
you could find very common elements of a, of a somewhat consistent process that you go by and you can identify bottlenecks in that process. In this case, we identified a couple of key bottlenecks in this part. So this is just the application testing part of that broader workflow I showed you. Um, I'm not showing the polymerization or the formulation parts, but those also had details um, that we mapped out. But imagine you did this, right? And you found, you know, well, early on in this application testing, you can see there's this little loop here, this thickness optimization loop. And you find, oh, wow, we're really wasting a lot of our formulation material here uh, when we do our spin coating. We're consuming a lot of that material, which is then unavailable to us uh, to do the, the downstream testing. And then you may identify, well, wow, we're, we're really spending a lot of time doing this, this analysis here of the pattern. Uh, it's really slow and there's a lot of user variability. Um, and so you can, you, can, you can pop these out and you can start to look at, well, what might a solution look like? How would, it, how would it help us? What is the technical feasibility? What are the risks? And you can make a decision about where to focus first. So you could say, well, you know what? Let's start with one of these things at a time. Let's go after this thickness optimization part of the process, right? It seems like something we could, we could leverage machine learning and AI to help us with um, to reduce this waste. Um, and it seems simple enough that we could get something built in a couple months. So I, before I go on with that story, I want to ask you a question sort of following up from this diagram I've showed you. Um, you know, have you tried mapping out your team's process uh, to identify bottlenecks and improvement opportunities? I'm really curious to see you know, how many of you have done something like this. You know, yes, somewhat, um, or no. Um, and it's also pretty interesting uh, when you start to do this, you learn all sorts of funny things like, you think it's really uniform, but then you talk to different researchers and you find different people have different d opinions about how it's done or how it should be done. It can be very revealing um, about, you know, what should the process be, uh, um, even beyond sort of software technologies, just understanding differences of opinion and differences of um, process. All right, so we got yes, somewhat, and no. All right, looks like we got a good amount of responses. So I hear the results. Uh, we have, you know, most of you said no, that's pretty much expected. I definitely expected that would be the case. Um, as you think about that, you know, maybe there's reasons no, but think about, you know, maybe you bring that back to your, to your team and think about this shouldn't take that long, maybe a couple hours um, to stimulate some discussions about what you might do uh, for process improvement. Uh, there's there's a few somewhat, um, but yeah, a, a minority of you have actually uh, done this in a more rigorous way. So I, I, I highly encourage you to do this as a way to to move towards continuous improvement of your processes. Okay, number three. Let's complement our small data with large domain expertise. So as we're trying to build a solution for something, um, we want to lean on our domain expertise in a sense. Um, the domain experts are really critical for success and you can substitute a lack of data for domain expertise because domain expertise can help you shape the problem in a way that means you need less data. And that can be really important. So as we go through these kinds of problems with our clients, we are always working very closely with the domain experts to understand and extract their understanding and their knowledge and build that into how we define the problem and how we set up the solution. So for example, you know, a domain expert uh, will be able to tell you very specifically, you know, the optimization targets and known design trade-offs in the problem. They'll be able to tell you very specific success criteria and metrics that are standard in the industry or used by the company um, that you can leverage when you build a solution. They can tell you which import, uh, important parameters are there. They already know from their experience what are the likely things to tune. Um, and you can leverage that knowledge. Even if it's not written down in data, they know from experience um, what's likely to, to be important to look at. And they can tell you other things like ranges, constraints, and other things about the problem. And they can also communicate functional relationships. Like when this goes down, this goes up, or even if they're very hand wavy uh, relationships, these can all be useful when you're developing uh, materials informatics solution. And a point, another important point to, 
that's an extension of this is as you know, maybe you're engaging with the data science team within your company or external to your company. It's really critical that 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 data that data team needs to understand the language of science. You need to be able to have high bandwidth conversations with each other, so that you can translate the domain expertise knowledge into the problem, how it's framed uh, from a data science perspective. So this is really critical. You need to have very good communication between those different roles. So in this spin coding thickness optimization example I gave you, um, you know, we worked with domain experts. So if you talk to the domain expert that does spin coding, this is kind of their, their life. This is their view on the data and what they think about it. So in a thin film uh, lab, they're doing spin coding. And so the spin coding is often represented as this curve here called a spin curve, which is depicting the thickness on the y-axis as a function of the spin speed. So the faster you spin the substrate, uh, the thinner the, the final film will be when you're making a, a thin film. And this is, what, this is what they know, right? This is how they, they visualize the data and how they think about the data. And if we only had that, you know, we might say, well, you know, what happens above 6,000 or what happens below 1,000? And um, a pure data scientist wouldn't really know. They might just expect that it extrapolates and there's no, no issue. Um, but when you dig into the details with your domain experts, they can reveal a lot of important things about the problem that you can build into the solution. For example, the domain expert knows that there are constraints. There are specific physical reasons why we don't measure below 1,000 RPM. In that case, it's known that there's often poor film uniformity under those conditions. Also, above 6,000 RPM, um, it may be common that you know, the, the manufacturing facility can't actually spin the substrates that fast. There are actually limitations on the equipment. And so the domain experts know these things, and these things aren't always represented in the data itself. The data right, is just the curve, but there are underlying reasons for why data is missing in certain regions and why you choose to do things one way versus another way. Another thing that they'll tell you is that you know, they know that as you increase the polymer concentration, the formulation, and or the viscosity, this increases the thickness. So we have this line here. So the whole curve will shift up. And they know this. This is expected. And the curve always looks kind of like this. It, it, they're not expecting a, a peak. They're not expecting some other weird shape here. There's a known shape and, and trend that should happen here. So all of these things can be built into the choice of the machine learning model and the choice of, of the problem setup. So again, using that domain expertise knowledge, um, we can get by with training an initial machine learning model where the features of the model, so these are the inputs, are highly informed by what the experts have told us. We could do some complicated feature selection process, but you can skip a lot of that and save a lot of time and headache by relying in, on what the experts tell you and specifically focusing in on those areas. For example, they told us, okay, total solids content is really important. Viscosity is really important. We can automatically include those things. And sometimes you'll get interesting situations where um, some of the standard feature selection methods might actually not select them. Just by, because you don't have a lot of data, the statistical relationships are weaker and they might get accidentally left off. Um, but when you talk to the experts, they say, no, you need that. And then you actually include it and you see the, the benefit. So this is kind of how it fits. So then the next thing is, okay, we need to train a machine learning model that takes these as inputs and predicts thickness. So how are we going to do that? Well, there's a lot of choices in models. And so we need to be careful that we're doing this machine learning model development uh, correctly given the fact that we do have not that much data, we have small data in this case. We don't have thousands of examples of spin coding experiments. We maybe only have a few hundred. So tip number four, beware of pitfalls with small data machine learning. Most machine learning guides assume that you have a large data set. Uh, so if you're a new data scientist or a chemist getting started in data science, and you're learning from you know, generic tutorials on the, on the internet, um, a common assumption is that you have large data. 
And one of the main places that this comes up is with how you train, test, and validate your machine learning models. So when you have a small data set and you split your data sets into, for example, on the, the cartoon I've drawn here, you're splitting a data set of 10 points into a training set and a test set. And this is a random splitting. And the problem is when you don't have a lot of data and you do a random split, it's very likely that you're going to get a set that's not representative of the whole. So for example, the test set here just so happens to grab two data points that are highly skewed towards high X or on this X axis here. The, the test set thinks your data is way over here at high values of X, when in reality, it spans this whole range. And so you have here a test set that's not representative of the whole data set. Um, and this happens all the time. And it's easy to visualize here in one dimension. But when you're working in multiple dimensions, it can be very difficult to know if this is happening. But there are ways to get around this issue. Uh, there's a technique called nested cross-validation, which is standardized for doing this. Um, and a lot of guides don't talk about it. It's, a, it's like sort of a more, a more advanced technique. Um, and so we, I've seen many cases where new data scientists, they're just doing this the, the standard way, uh, and they run into this issue. And I'll explain in the example um, where this, what this looks like. Another thing to note is that uh, median scores are often going to produce much more stable models than a mean score. Uh, median uh, statistical metrics being much more robust to outliers. Um, in small data cases, it, it can be very important. Um, be a very big difference. Uh, but most guides just talk about means. That's the, that's the standard way people do it. They use the mean. So as an example here in this thickness prediction model I made, so I'm predicting the thickness of this, the spin coated film. And I'm plotting here on the right here a histogram of the, the test scores. So I did a test train split. I trained the model on the training set and I tested it on the held out test set. And I repeated this, I think, 25 times, so random splits. And then here's the histogram of the, tr of the test scores. So the score is called the, the median absolute percent error. So a low error is good, uh, and a high error is bad. And so what you can see this in this histogram, it's extremely spread out. right? The, the tail here of this histogram is quite large. And what this means is that if you had done just one test train split, and you'd happened to get an unfortunate split just randomly, you might think your model produces an error of 30 to 40%. Um, and then if you did it again randomly, you could get a model which is you know, less than 5% error, which is really good. And the challenge is you're using these numbers to make decisions about what type of model to use, how to tune the model. You, if you're looking at a single test train split, you're not going to get something representative of the actual underlying, the real performance of the model. So when you do nested CV, you're going to get, like this histogram did, you're going to get a bunch of examples, and you're going to analyze the entire population to get uh, metrics that are representative of the actual performance. And here again, if I was to take the mean of this histogram, it's around 12% 12, 12 error. So it's highly skewed by these outliers or these very, very bad cases. Uh, but the median is much better. And in this case, you know, we decided that the median was much more representative of how the model actually uh, performed uh, on new data. So this is something to be aware of as you get started uh, with machine learning. And as even, even experienced data scientists that have generally worked with large data may not be as familiar with this as they, as they come into your problem uh, working on small data. So in the end, the machine learning model we developed uh, predicts the, the thickness. And so like the domain expert wants to see, I'm predicting a spin curve. So this, this dark uh, teal line is the predicted uh, spin curve for a new formulation, something we've seen you know, it's hot off the lab from the formulation team. We haven't tested it at all in the, in the clean room yet. And we want to know what, what, should I, what experiment should I do? How should I process this formulation? And this this plot here gives you a prediction, and it also gives you a recommendation. So it says, you know, if my target is to make a one micron film, I should spin coat the film at around 2,800 RPMs. 
again, this is with no previous measurement. So we're using, we're leveraging our historical data to predict how this new formulation will perform and providing me a recommendation that helps me meet my target faster. And we're presenting it in a way that's, that's natural for the technicians and the researchers in the lab that are used to doing spin coding. So with that in place, right, the, the technicians and the researchers in the lab are using this tool, they're, they're finding success, they're, you know, they've decreased the number of experiments they need to reach their objective, they're not wasting nearly as much formulation anymore. So you can mark that off as a success. And you can say, okay, where do I go next? Where can I build on this success um, to other areas of the lab? And so once this is working, the nice thing is other people are going to see that. They're going to say, oh, that's really cool how you have that working in your lab. Uh, could you do something like that for our problem in our part of the process? So in this case, you know, the formulation team might say, hey, that's really great that you have a recommendation system for your, your experiments. Could you do something like that for us in our formulation part of the, the workflow? And to do this, um, you can leverage another tip, which is augmenting your data set with open data sources. In this case, uh, the formulation team came to us with the problem that they had. They said, you know, most of our products are using halogenated solvents, um, which are toxic and, um, you know, not green, not, you know, bio-friendly. Uh, and we're facing pressure from customers and from regula regulators to reformulate, to choose greener, more sustainable solvents. But we don't have that much data, right? We only have a, a few solvents that we've generally used. Um, so what can we do? Can we, can we develop a system that would recommend to us, you know, given a list of solvents available that we could buy, which ones we should try? Which ones are most likely to be a drop-in replacement for the, for the solvent that we're currently using? And so to do this, uh, you can leverage open data. So there's a lot of uh, government uh, organizations around the world that are funding large data sources, uh, things like PubChem, Materials Project, Open Reaction Database, and many more. Lots of different types of data for diverse materials problems. Um, and there's also ways to use um, large language models and other natural language processing tools to pull data from literature and patents to augment your data sets as well. Uh, not from one of these databases. So there's lots of different things you can do. If those, if those, uh, if that data is very analogous to your data, you could use it as additional examples. Otherwise, you could use it to, as features to augment your data set, which I'll show you in our example. So in this example, we didn't have very many solvents, and so we couldn't do some more standard methods of dealing with small molecules where we might, you know, develop molecular descriptors or we might adopt a graph representation of this molecule. If you have a lot of data, you can use those methods to teach, essentially teaching the model chemistry. Right? If I change, if I add a, if I add a methyl group or I add a, a hydroxyl group, like how does that affect the behavior? And with enough data, you're essentially teaching the model the chemistry and you're able to then predict the thickness. But with only a handful of examples, you don't have enough to, to do, to teach it all the complexities of organic chemistry. But what you can do is leverage open data. So in this case, uh, we pulled uh, physical property data from PubChem about the solvent molecules and pulled a variety of different you know, standard things about those molecules. And it turned out these properties correlated well with the behavior of the formulation in the spin coding experiment. So these can then turn out to be inputs. These are features of a, of a solvent molecule so instead of feeding the solvent molecule name or structure directly to the model, you're not replacing it with these properties. This is a vector of properties that represents that particular molecule. And that's your input to your machine learning model. And this, this can show a big improvement um, depending on, on the details of your process. So we had that working and we actually developed that tool that was able to recommend to the formulation team you know, given a, a short list of solvents, which ones would be most likely and most beneficial to try first. So again, we got that working, we're building on success. And we returned to this last step in the process that we had previously identified as a bottleneck, um, which is our last step. It's not always about machine learning. There, are, Once you get machine learning systems up and running, it's also important to think about improving the data quality and the acquisition speed of your data to feed into that machine learning system. 
So how is data recorded? You take a look at the data. What's the data generation process look like? How do you record the data? What is the slowest step in your analysis to pull out that final metrics that you're using as, as inputs or even as target values for your model? Um, you know, what manual processes are the most affected by human variability and bias? If you can start to adopt automated tools or, or computed tools to help you do these slowest, most tedious parts in your lab, you can remove expert researchers from those routine, tedious tasks and move them to other parts of the, of the lab or other parts of the business where, they're, where their creativity and intelligence can be used in a much more valuable setting. So yeah, the, the final point here is there's more to materials informatic than just machine learning. Um, software automation for data analysis um, is usually a really important part of a more complete solution in our experience. So as an example here, in this electronic materials lab, they were really struggling with the challenge of characterizing the patterns. They have make these large wafers and they have a variety of different test patterns. So they have lines, they have holes, and they have squares. And these are sort of set patterns and they're used to characterize the quality of the material or of the formulation that they've created. And historically, they were doing this manually. They would take the images, and then a person would go into an image, you know, a general-purpose image analysis software, and annotate them manually. Um, and this would take, you know, maybe a, an hour or a couple hours. You know, for a, for a new technician, maybe it would take longer um, because they weren't as familiar with how to do it. Uh, but beyond the speed itself, it was also about variability. Different people did this differently, and they would notice very different, very large differences. For example, in these circles, depending on the user, you're drawing essentially drawing a, a line across the diameter of these circles, and that's that's your characteristic metric of these circle pattern. And maybe you do it a couple times, but different people do it differently, and so you'd get variability in results. And that was having a big impact on the decisions because this this is ultimately driving your choice of how to tweak the polymer chemistry, how to tweak the formulation. And so what we did here is we, we recommended them to build an automated image analysis solution. And in this solution, it was sort of a hybrid approach. We first used uh, deep neural networks to do classification, to classify the different types of images, so lines, holes, or squares. And then, then this would proceed into a more classical um, computer vision al algorithm, which would sort of segment out and, and analyze this, the circles in this particular case. And you can really involve your domain experts in this process as well. They know currently what they're measuring, what, what matters about this picture, what are they looking for, what are the key things that are telling them in their mind, oh, that's, that's a deficit, you know, deficit. we're gonna go change this thing uh, in the recipe. So there's a lot you can learn about this and you can build that into the algorithms and what metrics you choose to calculate. So with that in mind now, you can see how this, this this digital tools are now moving as a kind of like a wave over the laboratory, one by one, making this laboratory digitally transformed, much more efficient and much more productive. So to conclude, um, I hope you found something relevant in this talk. You know, can kind of see some of the challenges you might face or ones that your colleagues face. So we conclude with six tips for materials informatics success with small data. The first one is, you know, get started with what you have. There's a lot you can do right away. Um, and if you have questions about what that is, please come talk to us. Um, you don't need to wait until some future ideal state when everything is better. Um, there's a lot you can do right away and you can get things going and, and have that driven by, by value. Focus on smaller tractable problems to build momentum within your team, within your lab, within your business. Um, it's, hard to un it's hard to understate the importance of this for tackling organizational change issues that you'll have um, convincing people that this works and that it's exciting and they want to be a part of it is really part of uh, digitally transforming your lab. Again, complement small data with large domain expertise. You likely have very senior experts in your company that know a lot. Um, they are very critical to making this work. Bring them into the fold. This is not meant to replace them. They have a big role to play in this transformation. And as you get started, beware of pitfalls with small data machine learning. Um, you can't necessarily apply out of the box standardized machine learning methods to um, your problems. You need to know what to look for. 
And as you're getting started, augment your data sets with open data sources. This doesn't always work for every problem depending on what data you have, but there's a lot of great data out there. And the, the, the environment for open data is evolving so rapidly. Every, every month or so, I see a new big thing published for a new type of database or data sources or a bunch of data has been added to an existing one. There's a lot of action going on um, in open data right now. And the last one is, it's not just about machine learning, it's also about data quality, data acquisition speed, and getting a handle on, on what data you produce looking forward. How do we make this better and faster? Um, and that's really part of a, a more complete materials informatics solution. So uh, thank you uh, for attending and listening. Um, we're gonna open the floor to answer the questions. Uh, I saw some coming in here on the Q&A box, uh, but we're here to answer questions now. But if you wanna reach out to us, later by email or LinkedIn, please feel free to do so. And I'll hand the mic over to Marie. All right, uh, one excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris and Mike. And just as, as Mike just mentioned, we are gonna open it up for questions. I just wanna remind the audience that you can ask questions through the Q&A box that's on your screen. And with that being said, we shall get started. Our first question is, do you develop your own LLMS or use it from available libraries? Yeah, I think I'll take that one. Um, you know, it depends on the problem. Um, I think open source is coming along really, really quickly, um, really fast. We're getting to the point that somebody can generate a model um, or specialize a model for about $100 overnight with a, with a good PC. But you don't necessarily want to do that whenever you have a new problem. Um, so, you know, oftentimes we'll get started with what's out there um, using ChatGPT4. Um, and depending upon your needs, you know, do you need security? Do you see yourself doing this a lot? Do you need to, you know, um, go beyond just the basic level of those? it may be necessary to start specializing, creating your own um, neural networks based on open source um, uh, starting points, for example. So I think Hugging Face has, has um, what is it called, Dolly. And there's other alternatives out there that, again, they're coming along very quickly and they can be leveraged for what you want to do. It, it does depend though, kind of like this entire talk. You know, what you do depends on um, uh, what you're trying to achieve. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Chris. Um, we have another additional question from an audience member. How can I use the data from our ELN for machine learning? Um, yeah, I'll, um, I'll take that too, if that's all right, Mike. Um, so I think in this particular case, a lot of these systems, um, they do have APIs or they're backed by databases. So. If you're using, um, if you're one of those people doing and, and you're working with pilot projects, it really depends if you're using a platform, if you're building stuff from scratch. But in any case, you can get um, connectivity to these things. Um, again, though, as mentioned here, a lot of it, um, if you have the data in there that you know that you're going to need, then you're in luck, you're good. Uh, the things to look out for is um, being flexible with, with what you need and don't necessarily let the that architecture that is already existing force you towards a particular solution if it's not the right thing. That's kind of hard to do after you've already gotten started, after it's already already been investment into those technologies. But again, what we're advocating for is you really want to start with what, um, what you really want to accomplish. And um, once you've figured that out, the technology part of connecting to the ELN and getting the data out is um, kind of the easy part. So, okay. um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, I have another additional question. How can you cross-reference data from separate streams? I can take that one, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this, this happens a lot. And in the, the example I showed you where we are taking formulations and bringing them into the clean room, you, know, you can imagine a case, for example, where the formulation team has their own database, right? Their own database, they're, they're keeping track of what they've made, um, you know, what the ingredients were, the properties, whatever, they may have their own tracking system. This could be an actual database or it could be just like a folder with files, depending on where they're at. And that might be separate from the one that the application testing team uses in the lab. 
But once in, in this particular case, we're basically combining two different types of data. We're combining the formulation data and we're combining the process data from the applications testing lab. And the, the model itself was trained on data from both of them. So if you have an API to that, or you have access to those files, you can combine those uh, two different sources of information into one, essentially one table, um, and where each column is as the, the, the data you care about, and that can be fed into the machine learning model. So it is very common that, yeah, there are different streams, whether they're databases or data sources or whatever. Um, it's very common to have this challenge and um, it's important too. I mean, you want, generally we like seeing um, the data system sit close to the, the people that create the data. They, they should own, the, they feel the ownership over the quality of the data because they're, it's their, they're in charge, right? This is our database. We're in charge of keeping it nice um, and providing that value uh, to the rest of the company. And so this is a common thing that, that we see and it definitely can be done. Um, and it's actually critical to do that um, for creating the machine learning models. All right, uh, thank you very much, Mike. This individual uh, has a question, does this necessarily require that all of the historical data is located in the same database? Would a first step be to try to get historical data out of separate storage locations and into one single database? Good question. Yeah, Mike, I think that's really Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of just referred to that in the in the last one, but I can reemphasize, um, it really depends. You could put it in one database, but like you have to think about who's in charge of that and, and does it make sense? Um, if you have separate databases that different people are in charge of, um, you, they may provide greater flexibility. For example, you know, the formulation team may want to add new columns to the database because they're, they're measuring new things or they're, they're changing things. And if you give them ownership over that database, they have more flexibility there as long as they're publishing to you and telling you what's in their database um, so that you can use it. Um, sometimes separate systems can provide a lot greater flexibility uh, that you need, especially as you're trying to figure out the ideal state for this. Um, you could put it in one database. There's no reason you can't, but it's worth yeah. thinking through some of the trade-offs. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that too. Um, you know, once you do internalize the ability to build your own solutions, which is another you know, another thing we advocate for companies to do. Connecting the data from different sources is a matter of writing a, a programming interface to do that. Um, there's trade-offs there, you know, depending on what you need for um, uh, for speed and, and maintainability. But nonetheless, um, the location of the data, um, yeah, is uh, can be overcome, I guess, in many different ways. So. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. Uh, we have about time for maybe one, possibly two more questions. Uh, do you have recommendations for developing larger data sets to use? Maybe something like design of experiment strategies. Yeah, Mike, I think you know we even had slides on yeah. that that, um, that didn't fit, so go for it. <laughs> yeah, I can, I, can, um, I can take that one. Yeah, so in the, the general scheme that we're trying to do where the machine learning system makes a recommendation to uh, a researcher, this is sort of what we call adaptive experimental design. So you're not gonna come, you're not gonna create a large um, design of experiments up front where you're testing all the different factors. You're gonna create a small design of experiments. It could be a batch or it could be you know one sample. You're going to go measure that one. You're going to perform that experiment. You're going to get the results. You're going to update the machine learning model, and then you're going to get the next round of recommendations. And so this is this iterative loop. So it's called iterative or, or adaptive experimental design. So you're learning as you go, and over time you collect a larger data set, but you're doing that in a very focused way. So you're not measuring everything everywhere. You are really focusing in your effort as you learn the space or your parameter space, you're focusing in at each iteration on regions of interest. Um, and this is a this has been shown to be a much, much faster way to identify regions of interest and then to then focus in and find those optimal points uh, relative to designing the huge design of experiments up front and just going through all of them. Okay. 
Well, I think that that's about all the time that we have. We're at the uh, the top of the hour here. And I want to give a big thank you to Dr. Chris Farrow and Dr. Michael Hyber for this excellent presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you to for the participants for being a great audience and your questions. Be sure to check CNEN or CNEN online for information on the next edition of CNEN webinars. Thank you to ON24 for the technology and the production services, and a big thank you to NThought for the sponsorship that made this interactive webcast possible. I'm Melissa Romero for CNN Webinars. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks, all.